Now that we hopefully agree that it's time for more pumping, more now, I'd like to finish off this arc of heat pumps with a discussion on some of the many varieties there are out there, what the parts that make up those machines are and where they go, and what's involved in getting a building from no pumping to yes pumping. That includes not only the physical infrastructure, equipment, and the challenges certain buildings will face, but also a discussion on some of the barriers there are to heat pump adoption. Some real, and some, let's just say, inflated. That particular wrinkle varies a lot depending on where you are on the planet. New technologies leave lots of room for misunderstandings. And this one is particularly fun because heat pumps are not new tech at all. They're a refinement of long-established tech used a little differently. Your refrigerator is a heat pump. In case you're here without seeing the video this is following, well first, ding! That'll take you there. But the Cliffs Notes version is this. Heat pumps move heat rather than create it. Although it may be colder outside than inside, unless we're at absolute zero, there is heat energy to be collected out there. And except in really cold ambient conditions, as in below minus 13 Celsius or 5 Fahrenheit, modern heat pumps are able to move at least two and a half times as much energy as they consume in the process, making them the most efficient way to use any source of energy for the purpose of heating a building in the vast majority of cases. That means they lessen the need for fossil fuels in the short term, which is good for many reasons, and in the long term they make electrification and decarbonization easier because, well, we can do more with less. Pretty straightforward. A small note before we continue, I'm focusing today on residential and light commercial stuff. When you get into really big commercial systems, well, things are pretty different. Also, this is by no means a complete picture. My goal with this video is to give you a basic overview of common system designs, talk about some pros and cons of each, particularly when it comes to retrofitting existing buildings, and then I'll talk about whatever other stuff comes up as we go along. Strap in! The first thing we need to talk about actually has nothing to do with heat pumps whatsoever. And, fair warning, this section might get some folks a little… heated. The wisest thing we can do in the short term can be expressed in these three simple words. Insulate, insulate, and insulate. No matter what technology is used to heat a building, the faster heat makes it out of the building through walls and windows, the more heat you need to produce to keep the building warm. If you live in a home that was built in the last 20 or 30 years, odds are you're probably in a decent place already, depending on where you are, of course. But in older buildings, well, heat loss is often a major problem. Adding insulation to existing buildings, which also, by the way, includes things like new windows and general weatherizing, is a complicated and often spicy topic. Some of this is because buildings are different, and techniques suitable for one type of construction aren't necessarily suitable for others. And sometimes, it makes more sense to demolish energy-intensive buildings and simply start over. But that course of action has lots of baggage attached to it, so for now, let's just ignore it and talk about improving existing buildings. In general, it's not easy, but it's definitely worth doing. Indisputably. A problem, though. It generally takes a long time to see a return on insulation investments. And when you're an individual simply being asked nicely to do it, well, that puts you off. After all, if you won't see savings for five or ten years, and you aren't even sure you'll stay living where you do by that time, it's a hard sell. Worse, if you're a landlord who is putting the cost of energy onto your tenants, you just don't care! Which I, for the record, think is real bad. Shout out to countries that do energy audits on rental units and publish efficiency scores so that potential tenants can see what they're getting into before signing a lease, and so that the landlords have a reason to actually do better. I like that a lot. Uh, anyway, incentives to insulate, or as I like to call them, insolentives, are probably something we should be doing. Like, a lot more and faster. In fact, I'll go beyond just insolentives. We should, dare I say it, just start paying folks to insulate older buildings. Maybe create some sort of energy deintensification agency? I know, what is this? Energy policy connections? Well, right now it is. 
The only way to equitably solve this problem is with public policy. And while I'm not here to tell you what exactly that should look like, I'm certain something needs to happen. And if I were in charge, I would make sure this isn't some financialized scheme where people get, like, loans tacked onto property tax bills. But you can have fun arguing about that down below. The key problem is that right now, many of the buildings which are most in need of insulation upgrades house families who would greatly benefit from them, but who cannot afford the investment, or may simply have no say in it at all. We should fix this. The fact is, unless something's gone horribly wrong, every insulation upgrade will pay for itself in time. And I'm just talking about the money part. Include externalities like energy supply stability and reduced carbon emissions, and you're getting even more bang for that buck. Plus, if you can save someone 50 or 100 bucks a month on their energy bills, you've greatly enhanced their financial security, which is also good for society. The trouble has always been, it's a big upfront cost which many simply cannot afford. Rather than engage in the national pastime of, well, sucks to be you, I would rather we help those folks. Radical, I know. And by the way, this problem goes beyond just those who cannot afford it. Sometimes sorely needed upgrades get deferred because incentives to do them just don't line up in any sensible way. For instance, I used to live in an older apartment building where all occupants shared a single gas bill and paid for it collectively in a fixed, budgeted monthly cost. The building was new enough to be pretty well insulated, but the windows were awful. They badly needed replacing. But our energy cost-sharing scheme meant that there wasn't a reason for me to bother replacing my four windows. My gas use represented maybe 2% of the bill. So even if I somehow never needed heat again, 98% of my heating costs would remain. However, if we had gone in together as a building to replace all of the windows, we would almost certainly have seen our gas bill drop dramatically, and suddenly the windows would actually pay for themselves. And pretty quickly, I'd imagine. Getting everyone to agree to it is, of course, the hard part. It's really frustrating when stuff like this incentivizes us to remain in less sustainable scenarios. And the less fortunate among us often have no choice but to take the worse, or even worst, option. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Regardless of how we get there, the better a building can retain heat, the less heating capacity is needed. And this also means the performance challenges heat pumps currently encounter at very cold temperatures just become less of an issue. Which, of course, means well-insulated homes are better prepared for a heat pump. So, insulate, insulate, insulate. Heat pumps are great, but nothing's better than helping a building hold in heat in the winter and keep it out in the summer. Okay, so let's move on, finally. You've got a nicely insulated home and are looking at replacing your whatever with a heat pump. What does that look like? The equipment in a heat pump consists broadly of three parts. The outside unit, which absorbs heat from the outside air. The inside unit, or units, which then put that heat where we want it. And the refrigerant line set, or sets, that connect them together and actually carry the refrigerant and thus its heat energy from place to place. Sometimes this is all packaged into a single device, and we'll look at some of those later on. But more often than not, they are split systems. Part of why I'm so excited about heat pumps is that they are incredibly flexible and also quite straightforward, which a lot of people don't seem to be aware of. I showed you this heat pump in the original videos. This is a single-head, ductless, mini-split heat pump, and it is the simplest possible split system, despite that mouthful of a name. Now, I'm doing a fairly deep dive on this style of system first, because well, for one thing, I have experience with it, but also because, in my opinion, it has a lot of advantages. I don't expect it to become that popular here in the U.S. outside of certain cases, since so many homes are already set up for ducted heat distribution. As you'll see later, that's a fantastic opportunity for us. But in places which aren't, this option presents a lot of opportunities. This style of system employs simple versions of those three basic heat pump components. The outside unit, the inside unit, here it's called the head and is mounted on the wall, and the refrigerant line set. 
In this case, that includes not only the insulated copper tubing which carries the refrigerant, but also a power and communications cable. Now, the reason I think this style of heat pump has a lot of potential is that it's frankly ridiculously easy to deploy. And I don't think that's hyperbole. Let me explain why. All it took to get this unit functional was determining where to mount the components, running a new electrical circuit to the outside unit through a disconnect switch, which I recognize isn't nothing, drilling a hole in the wall to run the line set and comm wire through, actually mounting the indoor and outdoor units, and then connecting them together with flare fittings on the refrigerant lines and terminated wiring on the electrical side. This was so simple, I did it myself over a day. The most complicated part was evacuating the line set using a vacuum pump and manifold gauges. Otherwise, no special tools were required. Just a drill and some wrenches, basically. Real quick, I'm not suggesting that you follow my example and go all DIY here. In many places, it's not even legal to work on refrigeration equipment yourself, because if you mess up, you can let the refrigerant out, and we generally don't want that. That's why people get licensed for this. I'm telling you that I did this myself to point out, this ain't complicated or particularly difficult. One concern many people have, especially in locations where air conditioning is rare, is that there aren't enough technicians qualified to install this equipment. That is a problem, yes, but I hope you can see through this example that it's not actually that difficult to get folks up to speed. I barely know what I'm doing, but simply by following the instructions, I managed to get this up and running. And after three winter seasons, it's still working just fine, so I think I can say I didn't screw it up. Aside from who installs it and how hard it is, let's look at other options. If you want or need the indoor unit somewhere other than literally on the other side of the wall, that's definitely doable. Generally, you can run up to 30 meters or 100 feet of line between the units, though you may need to adjust the refrigerant charge in that case. Which again, is what actual professionals are for. And what if you need more than one indoor unit, which you probably do? Well. Here's where mini-split systems get really interesting. The Asian manufacturers have, for quite a while now, been building these sort of like Lego sets. They are very modular. Outdoor units are available in many different capacities and with connections to multiple indoor units. And thanks to clever stuff like electronic expansion valves and on-the-fly load calculation, one of these bad boys might have five or more line sets connected to it, all going to different heat exchangers in different rooms. That not only gives you individual room control, which is pretty neat, but greatly simplifies the installation process. You only need electrical power run to one outdoor unit, and it will send power to all the indoor units through cables run with the line sets. That's actually something I want to focus on for a beat. I was unaware of this and was expecting that the indoor head would need its own power source. As a matter of fact, I didn't even consider a unit like this because of that false assumption. It seemed like far too much of a pain. But once I knew that the outside unit is in control of everything, shout out to Aging Wheels for his video on how he installed these, I realized this was way more flexible than I assumed. And as a matter of fact, it became far and away the easiest option in my specific scenario. Now, when you have a more complicated system with multiple heads in multiple rooms, this does add the difficulty of dealing with the spaghetti that is a bunch of refrigerant lines. But they can be run in various ways. They can go through attics or wall cavities. They can be run alongside or up exterior walls in concealing chases. It's really up to you. And, it should be noted, the indoor units don't have to be these wall-mounted things. There are options which get concealed in ceilings, they can be floor-mounted devices akin to radiators, and there are more options too, like air handlers or surface-mounted ceiling thingies which look like something out of a starship. The really cool thing about refrigeration technology is that it's quite flexible, so the sky's the limit. And perhaps the biggest advantage of systems like this is that they are cooling-capable out of the box. One thing you always have to deal with when cooling the air is water. Water vapor in the air condenses on cold surfaces, and so when cooling the air, this condensate collects and needs to be dealt with. A standard ductless head like this has a water pan at the bottom, and a little drain hose directs the water that collects in it elsewhere. 
The simplest setup is to mount the head on an exterior wall and drill a small hole for the drain hose, or just run it out with the refrigerant lines if they came in from outside, thus letting it just sort of pee out as it collects. But if that's not an option, there are other solutions too, like condensate pumps. But what if you currently heat your home with a boiler that circulates hot water through some pipes and releases heat in radiators? Well, there is a heat pump for you, and it can often also produce domestic hot water if you use such a combined system. Before I get into it though, I do just want to say that unless you are firmly committed to the idea of hydronic heating, which in fairness, I know many people are, I really, really think you ought to consider a ductless system. I know it takes some adjustment getting used to warm air being pushed around, but these heads are very, very quiet, and it's really not that bad. I recognize that in many cases, ductless systems are not a perfect fit. Like for instance, in bathrooms. There's no sense running a line set to a head in such a small space, but if it's on an outside wall, there's probably already a radiator in there because it needs heat. Also, let's face it, these aren't the prettiest things, so I get it. I'm just saying, don't rule these out right away, particularly since they offer cooling, which might be increasingly necessary as time goes on. If you're on team radiator though, and or on team in-floor heating, I suppose, air to water heat pumps are pretty common. These will effectively replace a boiler by running a refrigerant line set from an outside heat collecting unit, much like this one, into a refrigerant to water heat exchanger, which replaces your boiler. This can be a more turnkey solution, However, these units generally don't produce water as hot as a conventional boiler does. Depending on the radiators you currently have, this could be an issue. The solution is pretty simple in that case, just replacing radiators as necessary. But if it comes up, well then that's more work and more cost. Also an option are high temperature air to water heat pumps that eliminate that potential hiccup, but those tend to be less efficient, particularly in cold climates, so there is definitely a trade-off, as is the case with pretty much everything. But anyway, one thing that I want to stress is that all a heat pump does is collect heat from outside and move it, one might say pump it, indoors. The equipment which accomplishes this might seem a little strange if you're not used to it, and it definitely feels weird to be getting heat from colder air. But the end goal is the same as it always has been release heat where we want it so our homes stay warm. Air to water heat pumps allow you to use pretty much the same heat distribution system you already have, which has value, especially since there's typically only one line set to run in that case, so the installation is less intensive. Plus, of course, there is value in familiarity too. I would suggest, however, that you make a deep assessment before committing to one or the other, assuming you have the choice. Now I'd like to focus on the challenges to heat pump adoption, with a particular emphasis on the situation here in the United States. As I said in an earlier video, the immensely frustrating thing about the way heat pumps have been deployed here is that the vast majority of single-family homes already have excellent infrastructure in place for a heat pump. Many other housing types are well prepared too, but homes with central air conditioning are basically already set. There is already an outside unit with a decent electrical supply run to it. There is already an inside unit in the form of an evaporator coil. Someone has already planned a path for a line set to go, and even went so far as to put it there. And there is already an air handler and ductwork to work with it all. And of course, that means a lot of boxes, in fact, pretty much all of them, are already checked for many people over here. Because, once again, air conditioners are heat pumps. We just tend to not bother with the reversing valves because, but sometimes, thinking is rampant. The good news of widespread use of air conditioning is that we already have trained technicians who know how to install and service heat pumps. They're doing it all the time, even if we haven't realized it. And that is an advantage compared to other parts of the world. The less good news for us is that, so far anyway, systems which could best take advantage of all that existing infrastructure just aren't very good. I'm not just saying that, by the way. I can back this up with data. 
A fantastic resource I was pointed to by Ian on Twitter is the list of air source heat pumps maintained by NEEP, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships. They track, among other things, the COP at 5 degrees, and we can simply sort by that figure and see who's making the best stuff. Right now, I want you to look at the ducting configuration column. The best performers are overwhelmingly non-ducted configurations. These are mini-split systems. When you see multi-zone mix of non-ducted and ducted, those are the Lego-like systems I was talking about earlier. Those can connect to both a ductless head and a ducted air handler at the same time, which is pretty neat. Hello! Voice Over Me is here to tell you that, well, this section of the video has become a bit of a disaster. I'll explain, but first, these excellent systems at the very top of the list aren't just mini-splits. Some are what are known as VRF systems, and that stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow. This tech is really neat because when some rooms are too warm but others are too cold, it allows the system to move heat within the building. It does this by pumping the refrigerant between rooms, taking energy out of one room to cool it, and dumping it in another to warm it up. That tech is pretty unlikely to see use in the home, although apartment buildings are likely to deploy it. This excellent Fujitsu machine, for example, can actually have 15 heads connected to it, and since any head can heat while the others are cooling, or vice versa, it's ideal for multifamily setups. Best of all, its performance is amazing. Its COP is a stellar 3.54 even at 5 Fahrenheit or minus 13 Celsius, and it retains nearly all of its capacity at that temperature. The performance of this machine is so good that even here in Chicago, so long as you had decent insulation, there would almost never be a need for an alternate heat source, which is fantastic. Anyway, I was about to say, to see the machines that American homes can best take advantage of, we need to filter for single-zone, centrally ducted systems. And then I would have shown you how there's basically only one decent product line from Carrier, and nothing else. This is still kinda close to the case, and the American giants of the industry should absolutely be ashamed of themselves for continuing to pump out the same mediocre equipment ancient 13-seer air conditioners, which is a horrible efficiency in 2022, are still getting made, unfortunately, while various companies in Asia are actually innovating. However, I can happily report that the situation is at least a bit better than that. For whatever reason, when I first wrote this section, I couldn't see any of these units, those with the brands Allied, Duquesne, Comfort Air, Concord, and Century. Maybe these just got added to the list, maybe something was wonky when I looked it up, I don't know. But these have a very good COP at 5 Fahrenheit, and retain a decent chunk of their capacity in that cold. It could be better, yes, but roughly two-thirds is still pretty good. That'll keep your backup system from kicking on unless it gets frightfully cold. And these are your typical, what I call barrel-style American outdoor units and evaporator coils. This is the exact sort of equipment that gets installed here all the time. The fact is, there's really nothing fundamentally different between one of these and a mini-split. They're the same parts, in fact, the same machines, just in different form factors. It seems that the tech which gets put into commodity mini-splits as a matter of course, basically variable speed compressors and more intelligent control logic, is finally making its way into at least a few American-style machines. Now, the other thing I want to talk about here is the HSPF, or Heating Seasonal Performance Factor. This is a metric which attempts to give an overall average efficiency throughout a heating season. These units all have pretty mediocre HSPF ratings, which is very weird because an HSPF of 9 should indicate an average COP of only 2.63, but here on the NEEP list, it bests that even at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. I do not know the reason for this discrepancy, and if you do, by all means, please share. Now, although the situation is improving for us, it's still pretty bad, and there are some other complications which I'll get to in a bit. But now, to set the stage for the next section, pretend that you didn't know about the units we just saw and that there was only one decent product line available in the US. You'd probably want to ask, Why is this? Well, I'd be happy to speculate. I think a number of factors have combined to make the American manufacturers largely… just not really care. First, 
The historically cheap cost of natural gas means that there's been little reason from the consumer's point of view to go with a heat pump if they have access to the gas grid. And since most really cold places have gas grids, at least where there's the density to make it work, it's rational from a consumer's perspective to not bother with a heat pump. Because energy is energy, you can convert the units your natural gas is built in, here that's the therm, to the kilowatt hour and make an apples to apples cost comparison. Here in Chicagoland, at least until recently, gas has cost about a quarter what electricity does for the same amount of delivered energy. That has meant that heat pumps basically never made any sense here. Locally, we need a consistent COP of four just to break even with the cost of gas. And attaining that is, frankly, hard, even now, but especially 20 plus years ago. Around here, people just wanted air conditioning in the summer and already had some sort of cheap heat, which a heat pump couldn't touch on cost. And so the typical air conditioning system in my climate is super basic. In most cases, it's a single capacity, single speed system that is either on or off. And of course, it's tacked on to the gas fired heating system made by the same manufacturer. Makes you wonder if they don't wanna cannibalize their furnace sales, doesn't it? Now, most all of these manufacturers do make reversible air conditioners and have for many years. But in general, they're the same basic one speed, one capacity condensing units that we install here, but equipped with a reversing valve and some sort of defrost timers. As a matter of fact, if you've ever wondered why a thermostat terminal board has so many connections, well, the O terminal tells the condenser to reverse flow for heating. Now, those heat pumps, although they're mediocre, work well enough in the regions of the US with milder climates. And those regions typically don't have widespread gas infrastructure, so many homes are all electric from the start. These factors have combined to create little reason for American HVAC manufacturers to develop their air conditioners into competent cold climate heat pumps. And the lasting effect of all this is that we are currently in a place where getting a cold climate heat pump is just not easy here. Even though we are pumping out heat pumps right and left, we make loads of air conditioners but relatively few are made reversible and fewer still are equipped with the tech to make them heat when it gets Chicago levels of cold. This limited supply combined with the sudden interest in heat pumps has led to many suppliers and installers charging rather absurd premiums for these systems. If you can even get them to give you a quote. Let me tell you a story. A friend of mine had their AC unit die last summer. Their heat source is propane, which, while cheaper than electricity, isn't that much cheaper. I suggested that they should look into getting a Mitsubishi Hyperheat unit, and I helped arrange quotes from the local HVAC company, who is one of Mitsubishi's authorized contractors. A basic replacement of the air conditioner, including a new evaporator coil and line set, was quoted at $3,000. This option would continue to use the existing furnace as the air handler, and thus propane for heat. A three-head ductless system from Mitsubishi, a perfect solution for their small home in a number of ways, would cost more than $12,000. That's a gigantic price difference. And if we dig a little into it, we find what can only be described as greed. Yes, the equipment from Mitsubishi is expensive compared to the commodity-grade carrier equipment in the other quote. But it's not $9,000 more expensive. This online wholesaler would sell me similar equipment for about 5,500 bucks shipped. Let's say that with the line sets and a few other ancillary things, the equipment cost is 6,500 bucks. Now I know that mounting wall units and drilling holes for them is more and different work than what is required to replace a condenser and line set, but I can't see it being $6,000 worth of work, especially when I did it myself that one time in a day, learning as I went. Actually, when you consider that the technician who ended up replacing the air conditioner needed torches for brazing, had to run copper lines through utility spaces rather than the exterior of the building as they would have for the ductless install, and needed to fit a new evaporator coil into a cramped space above the furnace, which ended up taking pretty much an entire workday to complete, 
I can honestly say that I feel like installing the three head system would have been easier for an experienced technician. And by the way, there was already sufficient electrical power at the location for the outside unit. I will admit I'm not in the HVAC business, but my gut tells me the company could have made more money on that job in the end if they quoted it at 9,000, a much easier to swallow price that made the payback period reasonable, but trying to get another three grand out of it lost them the sale. If I were to guess, that company puts a fixed percentage markup on all the equipment they sell, which I would not call savvy, but that's just me. Now, if you think that's bad, here's a real head scratcher. My brother lives in San Diego. If you don't know, San Diego really doesn't get cold. And for some silly reason, his home has a central AC with a gas furnace, pretty much the same system you'd find here in Illinois. Electricity is very expensive there, yes, but there's just hardly a need for heating. He tells me he and his partner used the furnace for just four days this winter. He wanted to get quotes to replace his aging AC with a heat pump. And the first company that came out? First, they said he'd probably want an expensive hybrid fuel system so he could keep using gas for backup, which, no, no. And second, the quote they gave him for a Lennox heat pump and air handler, it came in at over $16,000. And that was the cheap option from this company. I know that's California, maybe there are some weird permitting costs, but come on. My brother would be perfectly served with a reversible two-ton system, maybe three at most. He does not need a hybrid system, and he certainly doesn't need a true cold climate heat pump. And thanks to the internet, we know that the equipment cost for a 16-seer, two-and-a-half-ton system is probably less than $3,000. I mean, these people are making their money too, plus the line set and whatever other miscellaneous stuff. I cannot see the quote he got as anything but a dishonest company taking advantage of someone looking to install a trendy heat pump and just hoping they don't know what that is. This is probably happening all across the country and indeed the world, and it sucks. Heat pumps are not miracle machines. They're not even new tech. And installing one is either much the same process as the air conditioners we've been installing for many decades, or potentially easier, as is the case for mini splits. I mean, I would not go out and buy a torch, some gas bottles, and learn how to braze copper piping on my own, but I was pretty confident I could tackle a few preformed flare fittings, and I did. Hi, it's me again. I gotta cover a few more things in voiceover before the end. First, to make the last few minutes more explicit, the obfuscation of equipment pricing by installers is a serious problem, and one that, well, I couldn't tell you how to solve. Businesses are gonna business, but a real danger here that's worth a hard look into is that many of the incentives we currently use to push people towards better equipment, such as rebates for installing it, are ripe for abuse by these installers. Whatever savings the rebate might bring can simply evaporate if the installer builds it into the quote, and when they're inventing their own markups on equipment cost, anything goes. It would be great if everyone could simply purchase their own equipment directly and then hire installers for the labor only, but a lot of rebate programs make this impossible, and of course, few people have the expertise to determine the equipment they need. The best thing I can do is remind everybody that heat pumps are just air conditioners and are not actually special. Hopefully the more people that know this, the less gouging will occur. Alright, and the other thing I need to talk about is the wrinkle that is subpar ductwork. Thanks to the operational limits of heat pumps, airflow may become a challenge in existing homes thanks to ductwork restrictions. As amazing as refrigeration is, the refrigerant can only get so hot. It's a function of the system pressure, and that means you need a greater volume of air moving over the heat exchanger to get all that heat out. Ductless systems don't pose a challenge here because the heads are designed to attain a certain heat output, and the heat exchanger is huge compared to the air it needs to move. But when you're dealing with a relatively small coil shoved into some ductwork, you need as much airflow as you can get, and regrettably often, the ductwork wasn't designed with that in mind. 
A furnace, which heats with fire, can make the air leaving it extremely hot, so the ducts didn't need to be designed for the same volume of air as is ideal with a heat pump. It's the same problem with undersized radiators in countries that don't use ducting. But to be clear, this is a situational problem. Your ductwork could be just fine for a heat pump without any reconfiguration. One possibility is to simply force more air through them with a stronger blower, but that has limitations and can get noisy. But even if it is a problem in your case, the good news is that a situational problem can be dealt with situationally. It might be that to match the output of your current heating system, you'd need to have a much larger heat pump than your existing air conditioner. I saw someone on Twitter bring up that they were told they'd need a 5-ton heat pump, which is 60,000 BTUs per hour, or 17.5 kilowatts by the way, but their ducts were sized only for a 3-ton air conditioner. So they were told the only path to a heat pump was expensive ducting upgrades. But I say, don't let but sometimes thinking stop you. The fact is, you rarely need the full output of a heating system anyway. Around here, they all seem to be oversized by a factor of about two. So it could be that even if you'll only be able to have a three-ton heat pump, that's going to be all you need for the majority of the winter anyway. I can tell you that this is exactly the boat that I'm in. My 70,000 BTU furnace only runs about half the time, even when it's well below zero outside. So a 3-ton heat pump, which is 36,000 BTU, would actually be more than enough almost all the time. And by the way, this problem might very well be temporary. With new refrigerants and technologies on the horizon, who knows what's possible. From what I can tell, there's regrettably a lot of old-school thinking permeating the trade. Some of it is understandable. It's hard to explain to customers all the nuances involved here, and they just want an HVAC system that works. But some of it is also just weird. My friend's quote for a three-head mini-split seems absolutely bonkers to me, but it's become clear from conversations I've had that lots of HVAC companies are charging similar amounts. They're seemingly allergic to mini-splits for some reason, which is a real shame since they're a great option when you have limitations like poor ductwork. We're entering a strange new phase of indoor comfort. Much of it is the same, but refined, and yet there are also entirely new opportunities to be found. We just need equipment to get a little bit better, easier to obtain, and for companies to sell it to you and do the work for a fair price. Okay, I'm starting to run out of hot air. So I want to talk about a couple more things before the jazz hits. First, ambient noise. Heat pumps, unfortunately, make noise, and this has some people worried. Now, for the record, and I know this doesn't make it right or anything, we are surrounded by pretty loud heat pumps in the summer, and we are mostly all right. However, modern heat pumps are so much quieter than the air conditioners we're used to now. Some of that is simply because they don't do that whole thing old-fashioned AC units do when they start up. That's when you notice an air conditioner the most. Once it's running, you tend to just filter it out. Inverter-driven compressors have a slow ramp-up in speed, and you basically don't even notice it. Plus, aside from the whole hard start thing, they're just much quieter in general. Mostly because unless it's so cold or so hot that it needs to give it all it's got, it's running at a slow, barely audible speed. Like this. This is me talking to you in my normal speaking voice right next to a heat pump. And this one is actually working pretty hard right now. Let's wait till it gets to temperature and see how much quieter it gets. Okay, so now the indoor temperature is at the set point and the heat pump has slowed down to basically an idle speed. The great thing about the inverter compressor technology that you find even in pretty cheap heat pumps like this, is that they will operate at whatever capacity they need to for the given load. Rather than run for 10 minutes and stay off for 30, this can actually run at 25% output. That means it's less disruptive because you don't hear it starting and stopping, but it also just means it's quieter from the start. This is the ambient noise level that this heat pump operates at for the vast majority of the time. The only thing you notice in the winter is when it defrosts, you hear it stop, start, stop, and start again. So while I... Oh, it just stopped. <laughs> 
So I understand that people are concerned about the outdoor ambient environment and the additional noise. It's honestly not as bad as you might think. I saw a tweet about someone looking to install a heat pump in Seattle, but they were told it would be illegal thanks to strict noise ordinances. Uh, guys, you gotta update those. I mean, for one, I kind of doubt a good mini split would actually violate that ordinance, but if it does, well, looks like there's an ordinance we gotta toss out. Not only are they just not that loud anymore, but if slightly louder outdoor environments are the price we have to pay to help reduce carbon emissions and increase energy independence, I think it's worth it, don't you? If NIMBYs get in the way of installing heat pumps, may God have mercy on our souls. Lastly, let's talk about packaged heat pumps. They exist, but right now they seem to have some performance challenges which, well, I'm not surprised by. One very common packaged heating and cooling thingy is the PTAC, which stands for Packaged Terminal Air Conditioner. If you've ever stayed in a low to medium tier hotel in the US, you're probably familiar with the beige lump of cooling sitting below the window. That's a PTAC. They're also kind of common in certain residential settings too. Luckily, the PTAC has been developed into the PFP or Packaged Terminal Heat Pump. Right now, NEEP barely has any data on these, and what they do have isn't great. The PTAC is a design optimized more for ease of installation by way of standardization than objective performance. Hotels love them because they can be swapped out in minutes, and just by keeping a few spares on hand, out-of-order rooms due to heating and cooling issues can be largely avoided. Until recently, these provided heat via resistive heating elements but lately the refrigeration circuits are becoming reversible. I suspect these are going to have some upper performance boundaries because, well, their design is quite a compromise. If you actually were to remove the PTAC from its sleeve, you'd discover that the PTAC is the only thing separating the inside from the outside. That vent you see from the outside of a building that utilizes PTACs is literally a large hole in the wall. PTACs are really more like the guts of a window unit made to slide into a standard sleeve with strip heaters too. It's likely the case that buildings which currently use PTACs would be better off to de-PTAC. Hotels might consider replacing banks of 10 or 15 rooms with a large roof-mounted VRF system, and apartments might want to convert to ductless mini-splits. Actually, my old apartment building would be much better served by ductless heat pumps. With the bathrooms on interior walls, I would only have needed a three-head system for my two-bedroom apartment, two small heads for the bedrooms, and a large one for the living room, kitchen, and dining area. Speaking of my old apartment, another less common packaged system is the, well, actually, I don't know what its non-trade name is, but the Magic Pack. This thing is a packaged furnace and AC system. It's kind of a clever idea, but anyone who has to replace one of these, you have my sympathies. They're not made by many manufacturers, and you're pretty much stuck with a single option. But apartment buildings in my area are still getting built to use them. It's obvious from the outside because they have a very particular vent arrangement. I imagine these will have the same airflow issues as PTHPs, so again, buildings which use these might be best served by mini splits. And then, of course, there's the venerable window unit. These actually could probably be turned into pretty decent heat pumps. The bigger issue there is that window units, as a rule, aren't making a good seal between inside and outside. So while a window unit-esque cold climate heat pump can certainly be built, it would probably be better if it were put through a wall and sealed up with expanding foam. And I suppose at that point you're just reinventing the PTAC, but with perhaps better outside airflow. This is why mini splits are pretty cool. Oh, and yes, I've seen that neat looking low profile heat pump thingy. I'll be interested in its performance numbers because assuming they're good and you can seal it and the window up well enough, that could be a very powerful idea for certain places. But for now, I think we can leave it here. Remember, Heat pumps aren't some miracle tech we've never played with before. We've been using the technology for ages, and there are many directions we can take it from here. One fun one that so far hasn't been seen much outside of Japan is the use of supercritical carbon dioxide as a refrigerant. 
over there, it's called EcoCute. And I'm not kidding. Even now, though, we've got incredibly powerful and relatively easy to deploy options sitting at our feet. We may disagree on how best to move forward, and however we do it, it will take time and a lot of effort to get us where we need to go. But when has that ever stopped us? Thanks for watching. I'm certain something needs to. No, why did I emphasize should like that? Well, we went a while without needing retakes, and now we're at this line, which is taking forever. <clears throat> Working on refrigeration equipment yourself. Ooh, what? You can't change the wording on the fly, you know that. But you can argue about. <sighs> yeah. That was a decent tank, but I still want to do another one. Finally. <sighs> Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I didn't even consider a unit. They can go through attics or wall cavities. They can be rung. I'll I just I did it again. Run, not rung. Rung is on a ladder. A couple of caveats. First, I have. Heard <clears throat> First, was that was that weird? Probably would have been okay. <laughs>